signal? Mm -hmm. It's you're not. All right, welcome everybody and welcome to those who are joining us through a live stream or if you'll be watching this later uh, as a video. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we do thank you for this gift of life that we are entrusted with. And we pray tonight as we unpack what this gift of life looks like that we'd be able to better understand um, what it is that you think of this gift that you've given to us and what responsibilities we carry um, as we deal with these two difficult issues of prejudice and suicide. Guide our thoughts and our conversation. Uh, grow us through these study moments. Amen. All right, so uh, the two, actually there's three questions that were asked that we'll touch on tonight. So the three questions were, what does God think of prejudice and racism? What is the biblical understanding of suicide? How does a Christian respond when a believer takes their own life? So those are the three questions, and I put it onto, into an umbrella uh, called what is salvation? So uh, I'll, I'll explain why that umbrella is there, but obviously the question of how how we live out our Christian faith fits under that umbrella. So um, when we talk about salvation, often we tend to think of it as the moment we were saved. But not everybody has a moment when they are saved. For some people, that's something that's happened over a lifetime. People will grow up in a Christian home and they will say, I didn't have a particular moment that I could point to where I gave my life to Christ. My life was always just given to Christ. So um, it doesn't stop at that point either. Salvation continues to work. Salvation is God's saving act in our life. And that's a lifelong experience. So uh, I've got three scriptures here uh, that we'll look at that kind of surround this thought or concept. Uh, Philippians 1, 6, and chapter 2, 12 through 13, and then 1 Corinthians 18. Um, so maybe if uh, somebody in this area could look up Philippians 1, 6, and somebody in the middle, 2, 12 through 13, and somebody on the right, look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of scriptures. It'll just kind of give you an idea of, of, of what this trend of thought is, that salvation is not just one little moment in time. It refers to the entire act of God uh, transforming or changing our lives. All right, somebody got Philippians 1.6 for us. If they can jump in on. John, are you looking at one other? Okay. It starts mid sentence, but it will make sense if you just read that, that mid sentence piece. Uh, God initiated our salvation, continues his transforming work in us throughout our lifetimes, and we'll finish it when we meet him face to face. God's work for us began when Christ Jesus died on the cross in our place, he works in us. Uh, John, is that the study reference or is that the verse itself? That's the verse itself. That's the verse itself. Okay, so that's more probably more of a paraphrase. It's correct. Um, what uh, the NIV says, being confident of confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. God's work will carry on in you. So the act of salvation continues on throughout your life until the day of Jesus Christ. Somebody with Philippians 2, please. Sherry, thanks. Okay, yes, about that. 12 to 13? Yes. My dear friends, you have always obeyed, not only when I was with you, but even more now that I'm absent. In the same way, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is God who produces it, produce, I'm sorry, produces in you the desires and actions that please him. All right. So salvation is the process of living out a life that pleases God. It's a process. That's what Philippians 2 is saying. Again, it's not a once in a moment transformation. It's, it's a lifelong transformation. So salvation is God changing us to be the people that he wants us to be. Does that make sense? 
All right. Uh, and then last current uh, first Corinthians 118. Right, I can read that one. Okay. You got it? Thanks, Mark. For the message of the cross is foolish. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Okay. So not to not to, to, to those of us who are saved, but to those of us who are being saved. So in the same way, perishing, separating, giving a life that's separate from God is a growing thing. So being saved is a continuing act. So I hope those three give you flavors that when we say, are you saved? It's not just a question of, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? It's a, are you saved? Are you continuing to be saved? Is an important thing. And I think sometimes as Christians, we forget that. It's not just the act of, I want to be saved so I can have eternal life and get my ticket to heaven. It's the act of, is God continuing to do things new in you and change you in your own life? Because that's what salvation truly is, the continuing act of God's work in you. All right, are we all on the same page of that? Okay, so that's the framework for what we're talking about tonight. Dina? But salvation, you've often heard, oh, you can't lose your salvation. So comment on that because I don't I don't know if it really means they're saying well we know you can't live perfect enough to earn your salvation but salvation is as long as you've accepted Jesus Christ but like the scripture but does that mean should I go on sinning you know since you, I mean can you lose your salvation so as Methodists we say not because if you can't do good works to inherit salvation, you can't work your way out of salvation. And that's one of the things we're going to look at tonight on the topic of suicide. So you see what we're saying? If some folk would say that by doing certain acts, you are no longer saved. But that can't be true because by, by doing certain acts, it can't save me. Otherwise, I replace Jesus on the cross. I'm saying, as long as I'm good enough, then my acts are equivalent to Jesus' death on the cross. Well, obviously, none of us can be at that point. None of us can live a life that is as good as what Christ affected on the cross. In the same way, I can't undo my salvation by bad works. I can undo my salvation by denouncing God, by rejecting God out of my life. So in that sense, once saved, always saved, I, I have the freedom to reject God, totally reject God. Um, and in that sense, yeah, I guess you could. But I don't think you lose it in that case. In that, in that sense, you're denying it. You're, you, you, you want nothing to do with God. Is this making sense, to what we're talking about here? Are we good? All right, this will come into play with our, with our topic tonight on, on suicide. So, this is about God's work in our life and how God changes our lives. So, the first question was, what does God think of prejudice and racism? So, I'm going to let you guys answer that because we did an extensive study on this. Um, if there are further questions about it, I'll be happy to explore it. But because we've already covered this in, in depth, um, those of you who attended that study on what Scripture says about racism... How would you answer that question? What does God think of prejudice and racism? I wasn't at the study, but I would think that he doesn't like it. Okay. And can you can you say why you would think God doesn't like that? Well, for racism, that means that you don't like anybody that's different than you. And Everyone isn't the same. So consequently, you can't dislike everyone that's different from you and still say that you are a follower of Christ. Okay, so that would be saying that because everybody is different, you're the only one that counts. Do you see what Sherry is going for there? Well, it says rain falls on the just and the unjust. And I think if God was going to judge us by our actions, then he would have the right to do that, but he chose not to do that, so I don't think we have the right to make those judgments exactly. on racism. 
Okay. I mean, the, the greatest thing you see in the South is, is the marriage of, of black and white together. And um, some people say, oh, my grandfather turned over in his grave. Really? You know? I mean, so, 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 I fished that out a bit more because that is one of the things we talked about. Why, why would some people's grandparents turn over in the grave about cross racial marriage or interracial marriage? Do you know what the, what, what the reasoning is behind that? Why people said you should not get married across races? Do you know what the belief is behind that? Okay, so we covered this in the, in the topic. Most people confuse what the Bible said about God saying to Israel, do not marry people of another country or culture. That was because of their beliefs. Though. Correct. Not it was color. Correct. It had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with religion. He, should, he also said you should not be unequal to yoke, but throw that one out the window and see what happens. Sure, sure. <laughs> so it's not a question of race at all, and some people mistake that. They think that because God said to the Israelites, don't have anything to do with the Canaanites, don't go marry them, don't worship their gods. It was purely to grow the Israelite faith and the Israelite nation as a religious nation, as a witness for God. And he didn't want them diluting that with injecting other religions into the, the faith of Judaism. Then why don't we he didn't create whites and blacks and reds and yellows. He created mankind. And created him in his own image. And so, that being said, there's never anything I'm aware of that delineated the color of your skin or where you're from. Correct. But it's so deep in the South, it's, I mean, how do you ever overcome that in your families? I mean, I don't know, because it seems like even when you go to Scripture and you say to people, that's not what the Bible is saying. It's, it's not saying God is against other races than white. It's not saying that at all. People still want to believe it because it's, it's a cultural mandate. It's not a scriptural mandate. And some cultural mandates are really hard to change, even though people say, I am a Bible-believing Christian. My grandfather was so bad when I dated a bohemian one time. He told me, <laughs> you know, oh, you'll find him hanging from a tree. Yeah. Stay away from that. You know, I was like, you've got to be kidding, you know. I, I would say uh, an answer to that is what does God think of prejudice and racism is it grieves him. It grieves him. And as Christians, we need to really sit down and figure out is what is influencing my belief a cultural family heritage or is it a faith heritage? Because they, they, you can't trace that through Scripture. Scripture doesn't support racism. Um, then why don't we worship together? Yeah, why is Sunday the most segregated hour in, in Christianity? Part of that, I think, is because of style of worship. But if you look at a lot of independent, non-denominational churches, they are much more integrated racially than the mainline churches, uh, which tend to be divided by, by color. So um, I don't know how we trace that back, except maybe to some of our roots, like in the Methodist church, where there was a split over the issue of slavery. I would say that that may be part of what traces that, is, is the issue of slavery. But I'm not enough aware of or aware enough of American religious history to make a defined comment on that. Lay servant school is clearly integrated. Okay, yeah, yeah. What right. Else? So lay lay servant school is what Barker was talking about. So that's where anybody from any Methodist church can go and be trained in being a lay speaker or lay servant. And uh, yeah, that's definitely an integrated, open to all Methodist churches. Um, and there are plenty of other occasions we have as Methodist churches where we are all together, no matter the races. But somehow on Sunday morning, uh, in the worship hours, that's where we tend to notice that division the most in mainline churches. Well, you even find that now when you talk about conference across the, the world and, and the power of one person, one vote is 
rotating in the Methodist Church to Africa. Right. Yes, that is true. So John's referring to the fact that a general conference where churches, each church has a pastoral delegate and a lay delegate, um, the churches are dying out in the United States or maybe more honestly in the Western world, um, but in, in places like Africa and Asia, uh, United Methodism is growing. And so, yes, by vote, uh, the, the, there's a shift in the, in the, in the weight, for sure. Hmm. So I would say in terms of that, or in terms of the work of salvation, um, I think isms are always struggles for us, be it racism or sexism or whatever it is. And I think that's always a matter that we need to just be, we need to allow God to remind us. Challenge me, God, in this. Challenge me when I have thinking that is prejudicial. Challenge me when I have behavior that is racist. Uh, that's an ongoing struggle I, I think I think if everybody were honest, they would say it's an ongoing struggle in each of their Christian lives. In some way or another, we we prejudice against people, against others, because they're different than us. Are we good on that one? Any other thoughts or questions? All right, let's move to this issue of um, suicide. What I'd like to do is um, break this kind of into three parts. I want to talk a bit about some of the facts of suicide. Um, I want to talk about some of the history of suicide in the Christian church, how the Christian church has approached it. And then I want us to talk um, about well, what happens um, when somebody attempts suicide. Uh, what, what about the issue of that particular sin? Is it a sin? Is it a forgivable sin? Et cetera, et cetera. So, I think suicide, I mean, it carries a huge stigma. Um, some families are burdened with immense grief over suicide, and then they carry the stigma of what society thinks of them as a family because someone in their own family took their own life. So uh, I think that's a, the, the broadest comment we can say. There's a huge stigma over the issue of suicide. Um, like all things, people try and put this into different categories. Uh, you can categorize suicide in all different kinds of ways and doing research for this, um, you know, going from a psychological point of view of how they categorize versus a sociological point of view. This was the simplest summary that I found. Um, some suicides are a call for help or attention. People don't mean to take their life. They mean to get somebody to realize that they need help. Um, some suicide attempts are people truly trying to kill themselves, but they are failed attempts. And then there are suicides that end up in death. The ratio of attempted suicide or failed attempts to death is 20 to 1. 20 more people will attempt suicide than will die from suicide. And then you have accidental suicide where people have attempted suicide as a call for help, uh, but have gone too far. So they took, you know, drugs um, and it was a call for help, but what they landed up with was killing themselves. I'm going to add one more to that category when we get into the faith issue. Um, but that was the simplest kind of breakdown that I saw. Um, in terms of suicides, is that not not everybody is attempting suicide to take their own life. In fact, people commit suicide not to take their life, but to do away with pain in most situations. That's true of most suicides. The, the, the idea is, is or, the, or the understanding is that this somehow will bring an end to the pain or suffering that they're going through. I had a lady just yesterday, I believe it was, comment to me about this actress, or no, this Miss America, or whatever she was, mm. that, that uh, killed herself. And my comment back to them was, you don't know what cross she was bearing. You can't assume she had it all together, you know, and that's it. Also, something that's why we have so many suicides is no one recognizes um, people's um, cries for help. 
Sure. And they're not open to them or they don't know what to do with them. You know, I mean, I, I had people just at Christian Care upset of so much over something that you you wish you had something to give them hope. But in our town, we really don't have right. much to offer. Them. In terms of the mental health? Yeah, health. well, mental health. Uh, I mean, living on the street. Put yeah. out, I mean, lots of things that you pray you never would have to deal with. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't think suicide, should, I think it's uh, one of the least things you should criticize because it's a, a real brokenness. Yeah, it is a very real brokenness. And sometimes I think the stigma comes from the fact that people don't know what to say and don't know how to help um, or don't understand that a person would get that desperate in their lives that either they would go that far to call for help or they would go that far to 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 <clears throat> kill the pain, in a literal sense of the word. Um, so, so how prevalent is suicide? Well, there are 7.9 billion people on the earth. About 61 million people die every year on the earth. About 700,000 people die every year by suicide globally. In the United States, it's a much bigger issue. It's much higher up the list, and we'll talk about why that is uh, in a moment, at least in terms of a, a faith perspective. Um, so worldwide, suicide is not a leading cause of death. In the United States, it's number 10 in the top 10. So it's a very notable cause of death. Uh, women are far more likely to attempt suicide than men. Men are far more likely to die by suicide than women. So, for instance, in the top 10 causes of death in the United States amongst women, suicide doesn't feature. In the top 10 causes of death of men in the United States, suicide features in the top 10. So most women will attempt suicide. Most men will die through suicide. Interesting difference there. Um, yeah, again, most for most people in suicide, the death, death is not the goal. The, 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 trying to get rid of the pain is the goal, but heartbreakingly, suicide creates more pain for those who are left to deal with the loss of someone through suicide. Um, and then I'm going to use this as a bridge. Um, of the world's religions, if you break down Christianity, Protestants are the most likely people of faith to take their own lives. Protestants are most likely. Because amongst Christians, um, Catholics would say it's a sin. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, worldwide, Judaism, Buddhism, Muslims, and Hindus all say it's a sin. So because there's such a spiritual stigma to it, um, you will find that often people of faith are motivated by their own faith to not take their own life. Does that make sense? Whereas in Protestantism, we've taken a different approach, and we'll look at that in a moment, um, that sad, sadly to say, I guess some folk feel that they have greater permission to take their own lives um, as Protestant Christians compared to Catholic Christians or people of other faiths. Does that strike you as interesting or surprising? I think it's a different reason. I think um, that the, the people who are, I don't know, I, I hate to say this, but maybe Hinduism and all that, are more committed to their faith and in pleasing their God than maybe we are in pleasing ourselves as Protestants. Which it, would, it could be a faith issue. It could also be ties to a morality issue. In other words, if if you know if, if if it's a if it's a sin to take your own life and it's an unforgivable or it's a punishable sin versus God's grace, then sometimes that's the deciding factor. Okay. In other words, if I take my own life, I know that God still forgives me. Blah blah blah. That's why I say, in Protestants, it can be sadly uh, more of a permission giving. A thing that we, we have started, but we'll get to that in a moment. Whichever category 
whatever cause, whatever the reason is, if suicide's an issue for you, please get help. I mean, there are suicide helplines. I know our county doesn't have much support in terms of mental health, but there are other places to get that help. Um, come and speak with your pastor. I, I am not a counselor, but at least we can make a beginning. At least we can make a start. Call a friend. Um, try and do something um, to, 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 to reach out. I mean, are there any statistics to show where... I never thought it was much of a thought out long process. It was more of a, you know, being down in the dumps and then you just hit your limit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think the hard thing there is. Um, you don't know. So, from, from what I remember in the research, most suicides are not impulsive. Really? Or they are not impulsive. Yeah, most of them have. They're premeditated. Premeditated, right. Most of them do have a well, a really well-formulated plan. Yeah. And another thing, if a person is going to really, like you say, execute their plan, and if they're really going to commit suicide, they're not going to tell anyone. That's right. No one. Absolutely no one. The main reason they have their reasons and their feelings of why they're going to do it, and they don't want to be stopped. And even if you know they're going to and you stop them, eventually they still will. Right, so that would fit into this category that those who do want to take their own lives seldom do call out for help. Those who do call out for help, I'm saying, please call out for help. Find it in the right ways, but you are right. Um, we can get into a, a whole different topic, but just to perhaps help us understand that somebody who who sees death as the ultimate healing from their pain, because there's no other solution in life, if they don't succeed the first time, they will probably try again. It's called suicide ideation. It's the belief that that kind of once you've attempted it, um, it, it becomes more and more appealing if you didn't succeed in terms of taking your own life. But remember, there's, there's, there's a big difference between these two. Some go too far, but those who do want to take their own lives will take their own lives, yes. That, and that's, that's a shock for some folk to, to handle because they're like, I didn't see any signals. I, I, how did this happen? Whereas often the call for help has more signals to it. I'm not an expert on this matter at all. I'm trying to recall my studies um, in preparation for this. Anybody else want to add some thoughts or insights or understandings before I go into the history of suicide in the Christian church? All right, so let's talk about how has the Christian church handled suicide? Um, in the 5th century, Augustine, who was one of the early church uh, deep thinkers, said the commandment, thou shalt not kill, applied to your own self. So the mandate to not kill others applied to your own self. And he said in that sense, it, it con the scripture condemned suicide because killing your own self was uh, just as bad as any, as any other uh, attempted murdering in someone else. However, there's an interesting fact behind that. The early Christian church struggled with people who were, you know, we, we you've heard of the, the expression death by cop? Death by cop. So somebody wants to, they don't want to pull the gun on themselves, but they'll do something and the, and, and, and the police will shoot them. They want the police to shoot them. They want to die, but they don't want to pull the trigger. Okay. In the early Christian church, death by martyrdom was a big issue. People wanted to die and go to heaven, and so they were happy to be martyrs so that they could die and go to, to heaven. And from the history that I read, Augustine was trying to address this and the church was trying to make a heavier and heavier statement about taking your own life, even if you're doing it in the sense of giving up your life for the sake of your faith, is wrong. There's a question of intention there. 
Because if you truly are living out your faith and you are killed for it, that's one thing. But if you're seeking out death through martyrdom, guys like Augustine was saying, that's a problem. Because essentially you're committing suicide uh, because you don't want to live on earth anymore. You want to be in heaven. We'll talk about what, what Paul's struggle was with that in a moment. That's kind of how the like Twin Towers and that um, foreign countries get people to do things. Oh yeah, yeah. So the reward, the reward of 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 killing your own self, um, you know, virgins in heaven or whatever that may be. Yeah. So I guess, I guess there were some parallels. I'm not sure. I want to say it's close or far away, but I could see the parallels that essentially early Christians were saying, I'd rather be in heaven than here on earth. So I can't take my own life, but if I die for my faith, then that's a way of getting getting to be with God. Um, in the sixth century, suicide was regarded as a crime. So now it's no longer just a sin. Now it's a crime. Um, in the 13th century, another deep Christian apologist, Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, said suicide was a sin from which you could not repent. Suicide is a sin from which you could not be, repent. So you can, you can sin and ask God for forgiveness, but suicide is a sin, and if you die with that sin, you can't repent, so God won't allow you into heaven. There's a major problem with that, a huge problem with that. Who of us in this room, if we died in an hour's time, would be without sin? We all die with sin, right? Every single one of us. So in your moment of death, even though you can be prepared for death, and even though you can confess, you're only confessing the sins that you know. You're not confessing the sins that you're not aware about. So we all, we all have unrepentant sin in our lives. And sometimes we, un, we don't repent because... We're ignorant to God for what we're doing wrong. Sometimes we don't repent because we don't want to. We want to keep on living whatever rebellious thing it is that we do from God. So that's the problem with Aquinas' thought was, essentially, we will all die with sin on our, on our, on our own selves, on our own lives. Um, so it's just the sin that differs. Even if you categorize suicide as a sin, it's no different than somebody, you know, a guy who's thinking a lustful thought as he dies. Okay. In the Roman Catholic Church in 1562, uh, they, they included a rule that said you cannot receive a Christian burial if you commit suicide. So a priest would not do your funeral service. In 1693, attempted suicide meant that you were excommunicated from the church. So if you attempted to take your own life, you're excommunicated. So the issue of, um, um, of uh, you can't get a Christian burial if you have committed suicide, the church also then punished families. Sold their goods, rejected them from the church. I mean, all, all kinds of, 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 of things that would just... Horrific to us as we stand here now, we look back and go, wow. Even if you even if you attempted your to take your own life, that was it. The church cut you off. No more mass, no more communion. And if there's no more communion, then that's no more salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. Now when you say Roman Catholic, back to that split, we're talking the real Roman Catholic. We're talking about real Roman Catholic. However, realize that in the 6th century when suicide was regarded as a crime, we're talking about the universal church at that point. That was an agreement throughout the church. The Catholic Church did reverse their decision on doing um, funerals for suicide victims in the 1980s. So now, if you take your own life, the Catholic Church will still do your uh, funeral or your burial. So that has changed, and people are no longer excommunicated from the church for attempting suicide in the Roman Catholic Church. So what are some of the thinkings as to why suicide, historically in the Christian church, has been seen as a sin? So Psalm 139, verse 8. Psalm 139, 
verse 8. Somebody please look that up for us. Psalm 139, verse 8. This is discussed in the context of the fate of those who die by suicide. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Okay. So suicide was seen to be making your bed in the depths. Making your bed what? Making your bed in the depths. In other words, going to hell. God's there. He's there. That's what it's saying. To me, that's a bit ambiguous. Because even if in hell, in my if my if I make my bed in hell, God is there. God is still with me. All the same, well, just, there's nowhere I can hide from. From me. correct. So I think it's a I think it's a bit of a misinterpretation of the scripture. You know, because God is not present in hell, literally. So this is this is trying to say so as Dina says, he's trying to say even if I hide in the brightest of light, God is there. If I hide in the darkest of corners, God is there. I think this is a reference to the darkest place of life. Even if I hide in the place that is most dark in my life, God's story. I don't think it has to do with your eternal destination. I don't think that's what the song is. So what are you say. saying now in reference to the scripture? Well, what I'm saying is, is that for a lot of churches who say that. Suicide is an unforgivable sin. That your fate in suicide is hell. They base that on that scripture. But what I'm saying is that to me that doesn't make sense. Because the scripture is not literally talking about where you, where you will land up for eternity. That's not, what the, that's not what the psalmist is trying to express. You following what I'm trying to say? They're trying to make a literal argument out of a figurative statement. The psalmist is not talking about God being in hell because we know God isn't in hell. It's just talking about even in my darkest moments where I feel the furthest away from God, God is actually present with me in this life. Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is the, the, the argument that I think they used on scripture for it being it's such a bad sin that you will go to hell for it, I, I don't see how it sticks. <clears throat> And I guess some of that thinking has changed because if the Roman Catholic Church does a funeral for a suicide victim, they're not condemning them to hell. So I'm not sure. They lived in hell on earth. Eh? Yeah. So that's also yeah, that's also a good good point to kind of bridge just as a thought that I left out. I'm going to reverse back to the some things to know about suicide. That sometimes mental illness and grief can make people do unthinkable things in your normal frame of mind that you wouldn't in your normal frame. I'm, I'm not talking about depressed in the sense of you're having a bad day or you, you know, there's a period of your life where you feel down. Depression as a mental illness can be so devastating. The grief can be so overwhelming for people that that pain is a it's, it's a spiritual pain, it's a mental pain, it's a physical pain. You can get depressed to the point that it actually becomes a physical grief, just like you've lost somebody. For some people, like I said, their goal is to end the pain, not to kill themselves. But they see that the only way that they can end that pain is to kill themselves. Does that make sense? And also end the pain that they may have cracked on someone else. Yeah, they it could. In their mental states. Right. And sometimes grief, people can be so deeply grief-stricken, a parent who loses a child, that, that it just puts them into a place where, like you said, for us to judge others, you know, it, it's just sometimes hard, if not impossible, to put ourselves in someone else's shoes who really wants to escape the pain. They're not looking for help. They're looking to escape the pain. So, sorry, that was a thought that I'd left out. So and I think, too, it. that people that... Uh commit suicide aren't in their right mind. I mean, it can say that they're not really, they know what they're doing, but they're, they're not really who they are. You know what I'm trying to say? Well, every situation has to stand on its own. In San Antonio, 
next door neighbor committed suicide. He was a teacher in high school, very well liked, very well known, but he had cancer. And this was many years ago and they didn't have type cures possibly. Well, they didn't then, but they do now. And he saw no other way out. He did not want to burden his wife and his family with the expenses that would be bound to occur. He was very logical. He settled all his business affairs, took care of everything, left a note, wait till his wife went to the store, went out in the utility room, and so he would leave a mess in the house and build himself with a shotgun in yeah. the house. But it was very premeditated by a man who was very logical. Yeah. At that time, the way he was thinking. Well, it was logical in some ways, but illogical in others. I shouldn't use the word illogical. So some 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 who have sought death and not been able to kill themselves have said that that suicide has become when when we say it's that they they feel it's the only option. It means all other things don't even come into play. That's the only thing. I mean, it becomes like a hyper-focused point. So in some ways, you may be planning this out, but in other ways, you become so focused on this one thing that that is the only possible solution. And you've dis you disregard everything else. Everything else becomes so much further down the list. Family, God, all the rest of it. That becomes such a high, raises it such a high priority. I don't think I'm explaining this very well. All right, let's let's go back to 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 um, uh, uh, suicide and Christianity. So there's six accounts of suicide in the Bible: um, King Saul, Judas. Some people will say Acts one and Matthew twenty seven say Judas died different ways. Uh, one says that he fell headlong. The other one says he hung himself, but he could have hung himself and then fallen. That's 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 quite possible. Abimelech, Samson, that was an interesting one to me, Samson. To me, that Samson would be, was suicide? Well, essentially, he brought the building down on himself, right? Mm -hmm. And he knew what was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. But like I said, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Where was that woman? No. <laughs> and a guy called Ahithophel, Ahithophel, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, and Zimri. Probably two people you've never heard of in the Bible. No. Um, none of those six is explicitly condemned for taking their lives. But none of those six are commended for an either. So the Bible doesn't account anything in those incidents. Well, there Samson are, showed us his own stupidity with the woman, so I didn't really matter what the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you're joking. Everybody else is joking. Um, there are incidents in scripture where people ask that God would take their lives. Okay? Uh, Moses, Elijah, Jonah, even Job. Job's an interesting one. He says, so I prefer strangling and death rather than this body of mine. I prefer strangling and death rather than this body of mine. But most of those where they desire for God to take them are more like, I wish I were dead. Or I wish God would take me, rather than suicide attempts. Very different. They are very different, and that's a very common thought. You know, I, pretty much everybody has a moment in their life where they think, "I wish I were dead," or "I wish God would take me." Um, you know, that, that's that's really hard in dealing with with people who are are very elderly. They reach a point in life where they're saying, "What's my purpose? Why am I still around?" You know, why, why doesn't God take me now? I don't understand why I'm still still here. So, or but, illness. Or an illness, yeah, yeah. Like his friend. Yeah. So, you know, those are, those are, I wish I were dead is very different than acting out on that thought. So those, none of those guys acted out on those thoughts, those who wished they were dead. All right. So in this last segment, what I want to do is talk about, is suicide a sin? And if it is a sin, is it unforgivable? 
Um, can, can we back up for a second? Sure. So in my role working at the hospital, we have patients, uh, most typically elderly patients, that reach a point and they stop eating and they stop participating in life. It, is that considered suicide? Failure to thrive, isn't that what they call it? That's the clinical term that's applied to it. But I'm asking, is that a form of suicide? Because they know and understand the outcome and they will do nothing to make themselves better. Okay, so this is not the body shutting down. This is no. an intentional yeah. decision. This is the mind that has made a decision that I'm done. I'm done. And I eating. will do what's necessary to allow the body to shut down until I go away. But then, John, you go back to scripture that says that we all have an appointed time and there's nothing we can do to add to it or take away from it. If that would be the case, then that wouldn't make a difference. <clears throat> but does a point of time mean that God designated your time or that God knows your time? Because there's a big difference between those two. Because if God's designated my time, I can do whatever I want in life. I can drive like a holy girl. <laughs> Which you if I'm not meant to die, <laughs> I'm not meant to die. I don't, John, I don't know how to answer that. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I would say, yeah, it's kind of a form of suicide. I mean, really. You made a choice that you know will kill the body. No different than curious. taking overdose pills. What about states that allow medically assisted suicide? Because they are states. Is that a suicide? Yeah, so they're countries that allow. I'm not aware of any states. Are there states that allow it? Oregon. Oregon, Oregon. okay. And the countries that allow that, I don't know. Is Oregon the only state, So far as I know. Yeah, yeah, that's true. The term is assisted suicide. Oregon is the only state. Wonder how they got that passed. Is that what Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, as Terry said, it, that is the term. It's an assisted suicide. So by intention, you are taking your own life. Or you're having somebody help you take your own life. But these are the patients that he's describing. These are terminally ill patients, generally with terrible pain. Yeah. So, so we, we enter into a whole different discussion here in terms of... And Barker would be able to speak to this way better than I could. At what point are we playing God in extending life? And at what point are we taking away people's dignity in natural death? I think doctors do it every day now by making some of these elderly go through some of the treatments that they, they don't need to go through. Yeah, so, okay, so that's a great example. If, if I'm given the option of a treatment, so, like, um, there, I mean, no, I won't use chemo. that. Again. Yeah, like chemo. If you refuse chemo, are you essentially... In choosing to end your own life, or you choosing to say, No, I, I don't want that medical, I don't know how to define that line. At what point are we playing God, and what point is medicine there to improve our lives? I, I, I don't know how to answer that one. It's an intention of the heart. Well, refusing chemo is that. Just, uh, There's some the patients that he had. That died because the doctor said he could help him and take care of it with surgery, and he said, "No." Oh. Yeah. Okay. The, the, another died. great example. He got pneumonia and he died. Right. <laughs> and there's another lady that uh, told me about a relative that they, he did not want any cancer treatments, elected not to, and he's alive today. Yeah, I just, I don't know the answer to that one. I just, I don't know what the You'll answer is. You'll know it when you have to answer, do you want to take chemo or what? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I can see people who are saying, I don't want to take chemo because I don't want to have to go through the agony of taking chemo. I might rather just let life take its own natural course. So that's why I say, at what point do we play God by extending life's own natural course? I don't have an answer. 
But is that playing God? That's why I asked the question. I just don't have a simple answer for that. I think every day is full of choices. You know, it's not just chemo, take chemo, not take chemo. It's do you drive over that rickety bridge or do you not drive over that rickety bridge? Every day has choices. You drive there, you live in you suffer the consequences or you enjoy the the consequences, you know? The thrill of running the red light, yeah. <laughs> but to me, that's different than saying, I am not going to take chemo, even though I know the probability of me dying because I'm not taking chemo is very high. They are the exceptions to the rule. But they're not supposed to say that even if you take chemo, if you don't die. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that's what, what, what Dini was saying with her illustration. Do you want to? Do you want a a time that you have left being sick, 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 or do you want a quality of life of doing what you want to do and say, okay, when it's time, it's time, and do what you want to do yeah. or can do? Well, from my standpoint, I couldn't have answered that. I mean, uh, I, I don't know what kind of quality. There were days you're taking treatments and stuff. You you wish you were dead. I mean, I'm very serious. Yeah. And and now look. What if I said pull the plug and now I'm walking and kicking again? I mean, you don't have those answers at that point. I don't think. Now, if you don't, but I, if Jimmy, I told Jimmy before, I won't go through this again. You know, I mean, because you have that yeah. experience. Jenny? Taking a spin on whether we're being practicing or trying to be God or like God in following the doctor's recommendation and doing the treatment, God works through the doctor to give you the treatment to be better. So that's really a God's, that's God's will and that's God's uh, blessing on you is to give that, give us in the same age doctors who can cure your right. illness. But I, so I think that, that that's, that, that's, that is certainly one and very valid way of looking at it. But I, I think some doctors also think that death is a failure and that their goal in life is to extend that. Maybe not, maybe not a GP, but like science, some scientists. You know, this is, a whole, this is a huge area of ethical questions. You know, at what point are we playing God and what point do we just let life take its natural course? This being based on Bible, what changed the Catholic Church's mind um, it's a mortal sin. We're not going to bury you. We're not going to give blessings or to, to today saying, okay, we'll, we'll stand off of some of that. John, I don't know that answer for sure. I, I don't, I could probably research, but I don't know what changed the, the Catholic Church. And I'm going to use that as a segue to jump back into our material. And let's talk about suicide here as a more as a very intentional taking one's own life. I realize there's gray areas. Okay, let, let, let me just change it. Let me change it. <laughs> let, let's talk about those who would say suicide is a sin. It's wrong. You're going to go to hell. Most Christians, the vast majority of Christianity would say suicide is wrong for the following reasons. And we, we're running show on time, so I'm going to kind of speed through them. Um, God's word speaks about the sanctity of life, that it's God's gift. That's that's underwritten premise throughout scripture. Um, God created us to be stewards over the earth. If I take my own life, I've denied that responsibility. That responsibility and that um, set-apartedness that God has, cre has created us for a very unique function. I think that's perhaps the word I'm saying. The fact that God breathes life into human beings, and scripture says that that's the only being that God breathes life into. Um, angels are spiritual beings as well, but scripture speaks of human beings being created very, very differently for a very different purpose. And people would say taking your own life is taking something that is God's. And the sanctity of life is God's sanctity, not our sanctity. We, we are stewards of it, but we are not the originators of it. 
So a lot of people would say that the, the fact that we are so unique, we are set aside from the rest of creation, we have a much greater understanding than anything else in creation about the sanctity of life, that that would make suicide something that God does not want. So, so if we use the definition of sin as that which goes against the will of God, then suicide would certainly fit into that definition. It goes against what God intends. Now, there are, I'm sure there are all kinds of exceptions we could make to that rule or could suggest for that. I'm trying not to get into the fringe stuff. I'm trying to make an over, a blanket that casts over this, this whole topic. Um, even, even in the midst of suffering, call, Christians are called to suffer. We are called to have faith in God, uh, that we would trust God even when life gets unfathomably difficult. So that would be going against um, God's will. Jeremiah 10.23, I'll read it, but I'll write it up. Jeremiah 23 sums it up very well. Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. People would, those who would say suicide is a sin, would say that's the ultimate example of that. It's for God, because God knows when we will die and because of the sanctity of life, that death is in God's hands um, and in God's authority, not ours. That, of course, raises all kinds of other questions about um, um, capital punishment. We won't digress down that road. <laughs> um, but Jeremiah makes a, makes a strong point there in saying that sanctity of life is God's gift to us and suicide is destroying that. So you would be hard-pressed to find a Christian who would say it's not a sin. If sin is the definition of it goes against what God's desires are for us, God's will for us. However, the question is, is it such a sin that you would go to hell for it? As Protestants, we would say no. And we would say no because we believe there's only one sin that is unforgivable. And that's blasphemy, denying God's work in your life. So denying God in your life. God, you can't, I don't want anything to do with you. You can't have anything to do with me. That would be the ultimate sin. And it's, it's not that God can't forgive it. It's not that God won't forgive it. It's that God can't forgive it because it violates our freedom to choose between whether we want God or not. Um, the Catholics in the earlier days said that it was a blasphemous statement to take your own life because you were denying God in that very act of taking it. But you go back to that same problem with Augustine that all of sin fits in that category and every one of us will die with some form of sin in our lives. So sin denies God's work in our life. Uh, just a blanket statement. So Blasphemy against the spirit doesn't mean that I deny God's work in my life, that I'm denying salvation. Um, so that's why as Protestants, we would say you don't go to hell. However, to come back to what we said, Protestants will more likely take their lives than any other person of faith. is because sometimes we see that God's grace and that any sin is ultimately forgivable as being a permission giving thing. When in fact, what we should be focusing in, in on is how would this grieve God? How would this action grieve God? Um, More than any other would grieve God? No, because all sin grieves God. That's what I mean. All sin grieves God. Um, as Protestants as well, we would say that uh, based on Romans 8.32... Romans 8.32 says nothing can separate us from God's love, not even death. So Protestants would say, even in the act of taking your own life, it doesn't separate you from God. And we would also say, going back to the argument we had earlier on, that if salvation is not given to you because of good works, salvation can't disappear from you because of bad works. So God's not going to give you salvation because you've done well. God's also not going to take salvation away from you because you've sinned. So that's God's grace coming into play. 
Um, the question is, do I take advantage of God's grace by taking my own life? That's kind of where we, we land up with. So then what, what affects my decisions more? Is it that I, I trust God and the sanctity of life is God or that, well, God will forgive me if I do this. God will, but is that a reason then to go ahead? The end of this, I think, is summed up in this sentence we've said more than once before. In all things, Jesus alone decides who gets eternal life. This is, this is God's, God's decision, not ours. So I don't think you could say to somebody, well, you know, they committed suicide, so they're going to hell. I just don't think that's our call to make it all. And I don't believe that you go to hell as a Christian if you take your own life. But I also don't want that to sound like it's permission giving to then go ahead and, and, and do it. What do you say to families who, whose loved one has committed suicide? Don't say a whole lot. Be there for them. Comfort them. Love them. Let them know that they are accepted. Very seldom do we have answers for death, especially death where somebody's taken their own life. It's very, very hard to have, have answers for that. It's a kind of grief that's a very different kind of grief. And don't say, I know what you're going through, because they don't. No. In, in, all, in all forms of death, um, but, but especially with suicide. Yeah. Okay, we'll push for time. Any any other thoughts or comments or questions? Where is it that it's um, not God's No one should perish. Yes. Where is it? But have you? I don't know where that scripture verse is. That God's desire is that we have not just eternal life, but meaningful life, life in abundance. Um, and abundance doesn't mean property and goods. The bottom line is nothing that you can reference in the Bible directly says you'll go to hell if you commit suicide. Correct. Thank you. Now, there's nothing directly in the Bible that says you're going to hell. It says there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's the sin of rejecting God's work or God in your life. That's the only one. All right. Did we find that? what that verse is? Michael, do you have it? Second Peter three nine. Second Peter three nine. Second Peter three nine. God's desire is not that we perish, exactly. even that we perish inwardly. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He's being patient, patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Yeah. That's the New Living Translation. Okay. That's pretty cool. Good note to finish off on. Let's have a prayer. God, we, we pause for a moment tonight um, to pray for those who are struggling with life. Whether it be that they feel so lonely that nobody's hearing them and they cry out for help through their actions. Or it be somebody who is so deeply, deeply convinced that their only possible way out of pain is to take their own lives. And we pray not just for them, God, but we pray for those who are around them, that they would be able to find ways to express your love, not always through words, but sometimes through support, through being there, through maybe speaking an alternative kind of word, your word. God, a lot of this wraps itself into the mystery of life, things that we don't understand and we can't explain, things that are fuzzy in our faith. Help us, God, to focus on the clarity, on the clear things, so that we can make things, sense of the things that so often lurk in the dim light. Amen. Amen. I wrote a happy book where I write thoughts this week, and I wrote, Prayer Begins Where Human Capacity Ends. Oh, so <clears throat> with my people.